Welcome to Plodcast, episode 70. Hard to believe that we've had 70 of these. Well, um, you're welcome anyway. Regardless of how many we've had, you are most welcome. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for coming along. So um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about a recent court case um, involving female genital mutilation um, where a... uh, a judge in Michigan overturned a federal law or declared a federal law against female genital mutilation unconstitutional. And he did this on, uh, on uh, federalism grounds. In, in other words, he, didn't, he wasn't saying that, that he approved of it, that he approved of the process, but he was saying that um, the argument went that Congress didn't have the right to outlaw um, a practice like this, right? So his argument was uh, a federalist argument, and that would be easier to take if people applied federalism principles across the board and not just when they uh, cut in the direction of political correctness. So leaving aside for a moment the, uh, uh, the question of who ought to pass laws against this? And I am I am sympathetic with the argument that that's a that should be a state level um, uh, thing. That should be a state level enterprise. Nevertheless, the fact that um, this practice is starting to take root in America, people are starting to um, see it as their um, you know this is one of their customs that they have to um, be allowed to practice. Um, raises a host of questions, all right? So here's, and, and of course, the, <coughs> excuse me, the central question it raises is the question of secularism. Is secularism even possible? Is secularism even possible? Now, in a Christian country, if, uh, if you had a Christian republic and the laws were Christian and the laws were expressly grounded on biblical revelation, then, of course, female genital mutilation or cutting would be against the law. Now, let me, let me set something else aside. Some, some people um, uh, go in for what amounts to a ritual nick. So they... They don't damage uh, a girl permanently. They uh, draw a drop of blood. It's a ritual nick. They don't damage her. They don't do anything um, that's permanent or life-altering. They do it simply so they can tell uh, their great-grandma back in Pakistan that they did it. All right, so that's the... That, and if you were to say, do I think a ritual nick ought to be against the law... I think, no, I don't think it ought to be against the law any more than, and this turns to a, another side of this same argument, any more than I think circumcision should be against the law. Uh, circumcision is not male genital mutilation. It's uh, body modification. It is a modification, um, but it's not mutilation because the point of circumcision, um, circumcision can be fully um, and completely performed, and it impairs no function whatever. But the point of female genital mutilation is to remove or take away certain sexual functions. It's to, it's to rob women of something, and I think this proceeds from a deep-seated fear of, of women in um, some of these tribal cultures or uh, Arabic cultures, or and, and, and this... Uh, sort of thing is enhanced or um, uh, amplified in uh, certain Muslim cultures. So what you're doing is you're impairing function. You're, you're maiming someone. You're maiming someone and you're maiming them for life. And of course, that ought to be against the law. Now, Christians should be able to instinctively um, tell that circumcision is not mutilation just from the simple fact that God required it throughout the entire Old Covenant period, starting with Abraham. So circumcision was the sign of the covenant, 
And the sign of the covenant was not to maim, um, sexually maim the males, because if someone was maimed sexually, that person was not permitted to come worship God, was not permitted access to the tabernacle or later uh, to the temple. So a eunuch or someone who had had his testicles crushed was not was not able to approach the Lord in worship. Maiming um, is considered in the Bible as maiming, but circumcision is not maiming. Circumcision is modification, not maiming. When when there's female genital mutilation, the the whole point, if it's done, if the if the thing is done, done, and again not the ritual nick. If it's done, the whole point is to remove certain functions. It's to maim the girl and the future woman. Now, if we then, if we then say, well, it's a free country, we can do what we want. Yeah, but the, the, the answer to that is not to other people. You, you can't do anything you want to anybody else. And that's true even of your own kids. All right. you, um, someone, someone does not have the right to argue, this is my child, I can beat him up if I want. Um, no human authority is absolute. The authority of the state is not absolute. The authority of the pastor and the elders is not absolute. The authority of parents is not absolute. That means that other governments, other entities, have the right to intervene. They have the right to interfere when someone is exercising their parental prerogative in a way that is ungodly. So if you're in a, in a church with a weird character and you begin to suspect that he's got the, his kids locked up in the basement and is starving them, um, you have not only the right to inter- intervene, but you have the responsibility to intervene. So the civil magistrate, when a... When a um, When the cops check on uh, a credible allegation of abuse, they're not overstepping their bounds. That's entirely appropriate for them to do. When pastors and elders discipline someone for child abuse, that's entirely appropriate for them to do. Now, what you can't do, however, is pretend to be neutral about all of these questions, which is what secularism pretends. Secularism pretends to be neutral about all the grand questions. We don't know who's right, um, the Muslims or the Christians or the Buddhists or whatever. All we care about is the process and the neutrality of the public square. Well, then what do you do with a, with a case like this? Well, what happens is, is what, you, what you're seeing happening in England where uh, large portions of the country are being taken over by uh, are turning into Muslim enclaves, such that uh, Theresa May just recently declined to give uh, asylum to um, this woman from Pakistan, uh, Asia, who was um, just given a reprieve, gi- uh, given a re- reprieve by a Pakistani court, and there are mobs in the streets demanding her execution. Well, what ha- what's happening is you're seeing how people, how easily people can be cowed. And when they're being cowed, you can see how quickly and how readily they find arguments. Cowards find arguments, any available argument, as soon as they feel the pressure. So uh, I'd be interested to, to find out this uh, judge who, who struck down the, uh, the federal law, the congressional law against female genital mutilation. I would be interested in finding out how many other federalist uh, decisions he has made. Uh, Or is this one just happening because federalism is a convenient way to argue your way out of a jam? So then, secularism cannot process this kind of difference between faiths. You You cannot say we're going to have a large, tolerant community Christians over here, Buddhists over there, Muslims over there, um, and everybody practices their own religion as they understand it. But you can, if you say that, you're, you're, you've always got a hidden proviso, provided it doesn't get 
too extreme and doesn't offend too many of our Western sensibilities. That of being offended, having your Western sensibilities is a uh, very poor defense. It's a shield made of uh, Kleenex. That someone's going to punch you and you hold a Kleenex up in front of them. Um, it's just not going to work. So secularism is crippled. Secularism is lame. Secularism cannot give me a coherent principle that enables me to look at cases like this and uh, determine which way to go. A Christian jurist could certainly do it, and a Christian jurist could do it in such a way as to leave um, visiting Muslims or, you know, uh, Muslims here on a uh, uh, a temporary uh, uh, visa or something, a grad student, and they want to do this, they would say, no, if you, if you want to do this, you shouldn't have applied for a grad school in a Christian country. That's, this, is part of the, uh, um, this is part of the cost of doing business. So here we are, Plodcast 70. Uh, the book review uh, this time around is a book called Sleuthing C.S. Lewis by Catherine Linskoog. Sleuthing C.S. Lewis by Catherine Linskoog. And I have to give a little bit of background on this. Uh, Linskoog, back in, I think it was back in the 80s probably, wrote a book called uh, The C.S. Lewis Hoax. And that, book's, that book has um, been re-released, updated and re-released uh, under the title of Light in the Shadowlands. And then this book is sort of a... Um, sequel to all of that, sleuthing C.S. Lewis. And it has to do with, um, it has to do with Lynn Skoog's, um theory, her allegation, th- her charges against Walter Hooper. Walter Hooper is basically the executor of um, uh, the C.S. Lewis literary estate. If you look at most of the books that have come out since um, C.S. Lewis's death in 1963, uh, the editor of those books, particularly the collections of essays, are, um, are, were books that were edited by Walter Hooper. Now, Walter Hooper is, was an American who met C.S. Lewis shortly before he died, was apparently offered the job of being his private secretary, and wound up... Um, walking into that position uh, when C.S. Lewis um, died shortly thereafter. So he, he just knew Lewis for a period of a few months, and therein lies the tale. So um, I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase uh, here and, and give you my summary bottom line uh, on this. It's sometimes, re- reading through this material, I read, uh, I read um, the C.S. Lewis hoax back when it came out, um, it was a highly controversial um, thesis where Linskoog accused, basically uh, uh, accused Hooper of forging uh, a few uh, pieces by Lewis that were not by Lewis, that were by him, by Hooper. Uh, among them were uh, the Dark Tower, the Dark Tower, which is uh, a fragment that has McPhee and Ransom and some of the uh, Ransom trilogy characters in it, and it's kind of a time travel, kind of a time travel creepy um, story, and a handful of other essays. Okay, so Linskoog's charges against Hooper are really uh, are really pretty serious, and the reaction of the what you might call the official C.S. Lewis establishment has been fierce in defending Hooper, okay? So there's been, uh, Lynn Skoog was treated as something of an outcast, although she was a very capable Lewis scholar in her own right and is a very capable writer. I really enjoyed her uh, book on uh, the Pilgrim's Re- Regress uh, called Finding the Landlord. That was a very good, uh, very good book. She's a very capable Lewis scholar, uh, and she met Lewis, I think, once, uh, before he passed away, and she's with the Lord now also. 
And that leads me into my next point. It, um, uh, Lynn Skoog's treatment of this is so um, meticulous and detailed is that it sometimes gives you the feeling that um, she's killing ants with a baseball bat, uh, you know, th- th- where um, she's examining every detail down to how many, you know, how many steps were taken between here and there. I, I'm exaggerating somewhat, but, it, you know, she's, she's running everything through a very fine mesh that it'd be easy to assume that she's finding problems uh, in Hooper's story um, uh, when there's no real serious problem at all. At the same time, there are some significant discrepancies in uh, some of the stories that that Hooper has told about um, the, the timeline and how he wound up in the position that he's in. There are um, are certain discrepancies in how this all comes together. Probably the biggest um, the biggest issue is um, the uh, Hooper um, sometime after Lewis's death uh, told a story about coming over to uh, the kilns after Lewis's death where a bonfire was um, going on. And uh, all the Lewis papers were being burned. There was a bunch of Lewis papers being burned, apparently at, uh, at the requirement of Warren Lewis, C.S. Lewis's brother. And, um, and so Hooper rescued a bunch of things from the bonfire, including uh, the Dark Tower. And that's, that's his account of where the Dark Tower came from and how he wound up with it. Um, Linskug has a letter from the gardener who was manning the bonfire that such a thing never happened. All right, so that's, a, that's an example of um, a, a real discrepancy and not some of the gnat strangling. So if you, if you read through Lynn Skoog's sleuthing, the, uh, sleuthing C.S. Lewis, I think you're going to have to put up with a certain amount of gnat strangling and maybe a, maybe a, a feeling in the back of your mind that maybe she's a little bit obsessive about this and, and is going to extremes, not, um, not being as balanced as she could be. At the same time, there are some significant problems. Um, if he says he rescued the Dark Tower from a bonfire that Paxton was manning and Paxton denies that he ever did, did such a thing, well, that, that should be um, checked out. That should be investigated. But Given the um, given the nature of the C.S. Lewis industry, and how many millions of dollars are at stake, you know, think of it this way: you know, numerous numerous books by C.S. Lewis remain. You know, it's over fifty years after his death, and numerous books by Lewis remain on the on the you know Amazon bestseller list day after day, week after week, year after year. Uh, there's never been quite a phenomenon like it. So Lewis's Narnia stories are continue bestsellers. Screwtape is a bestseller. Uh, Great Divorce is a bestseller. The um, Mere Christianity, you, know, you just go through the list. The, Lewis, the, um, the, the industry, the Lewis industry, is um, a powerful um, moneymaker. For, you know, for somebody. Now, it seems to me that um, there is enough um, that Linskoog has unearthed enough that it should be checked out. But I think it will have to be checked out after all the principals are dead and after all the people who were friends with any of the principals are dead. So, so, for example, um, Lynn Skoog had um, was on the on the wrong side of, uh, you know, she, she was on Owen Barfield's bad list. Owen Barfield was Lewis's solicitor and Lewis's friend and lifelong friend, and so he didn't have any use for Lynn Skoog at all. Nevertheless, a number of other noteworthies, um, Lewis's official uh, biographer, uh, f- believed that she. Um, was onto something. There was something there. 
But I don't think that it's going to be unearthed as long as any kind of personal politics are involved. I would just like it to be remain, remain enough of an issue such that 50 years from now, when all of Lewis's books are in the public domain and nobody has any particular uh, financial incentives in any direction and nobody has to worry about anybody being uh, betrayed or feelings hurt or whatever because everybody's uh, you know, dead and gone. Everybody involved is, is dead and gone. At that point, some enterprising student in, in search of a Ph.D. Um, should check into this and in, investigate it. There, there really is, a, there really appears to be a there there, but not all the theirs that, um, that Linskoog necessarily alleges. So it could be something pretty mild. Um, Walter Hooper inflating the length and quality of his friendship with Lewis, embellishing it a little bit, and that's sort of a minor peccadillo, up to the other end where um, where he's a forger, and a, uh, a forger and a fraud. That charge is really serious and ought not to be entertained unless, you ought, unless you're prepared to, to prove it, unless you're prepared to demonstrate that, um, that this is, in fact, the case. So one last comment about the Dark Tower. I've, I've gone through the Dark Tower well, three or four times. The first time was many years ago. I didn't really like it. And one of the things that everybody acknowledges is that it's pretty badly written. And uh, some people, I think, want it to not be by Lewis just as a, you know, they feel embarrassed that Lewis could have written something like that, written something that bad. But on the other hand, um, is as I've gone through it, there are a number of passages of the kind of flashing brilliance that I don't think a forger would have been capable of uh, pulling off. Um, and an understanding of Lewis's understanding of time and, and, um, uh, and some of the high philosophical work that Lewis does elsewhere, um, I don't think a, uh, a pedestrian forger would have had that in him. So all of this to say is uh, it'd be good for people to be aware of this controversy and to hold it in an open palm and not come down in any uh, definitive way on this controversy. Um, if you want to get up to date on it, lighten the Shadowlands, and then just hold it with an o- in an open palm um, and wait for enough time to go by so that someone can investigate it without hurting any feelings, whatever. So, uh, Plodcoast, uh, pl- Plodcoast, pl- I, I meant to say Plodcast, episode 70, and we come to our hamartiology homart- section, and that this is where we're going through the New Testament, talking about all the um, uh, different words that are, are used in New Testament Greek to talk about various sins. So, if something is inexcusable, we mean that it is really bad. The Greek word for this is anapologatos, um, and the Apostle Paul uses this word twice, once in Romans 1 and another time in Romans 2. Those are the two times this word uh, anapologatos is used, Romans 1, Romans 2. In the first instance, he says that those who live lives of moral defiance in, in the light of what every man knows about God from the creation, whether he admits it or not, are men who are without excuse. That's Romans 1.20. So they're without excuse. Their, their unbelief is inexcusable. Their unbelief is anapologatos. In the second instance, Paul argues that men are without excuse because they judge other men according to a standard they refuse to live by themselves. That's in Romans 2.1. So the two things that are inexcusable, according to Paul, are refusal, first, refusal to live by what God declares in creation, and second, insistence upon applying that same standard to other people. All right? So natural revelation, quote-unquote, natural revelation can't tell me what to do, and this same natural revelation is most certainly binding on you. 
So it's inexcusable for me to defy the light of nature, and it's inexcusable for me to apply the light of nature to others who, for doing the things that I myself do. Uh, an illustration that I uh, sometimes use in this regard is, let's say, uh, sometimes people say, how can God judge the world when, you know, this uh, primitive tribe in Africa never heard the gospel, never heard the Ten Commandments, never heard any, you know, any of that stuff? How can God judge the world? Well, uh, if if someone invented a cure for cancer and was walking through a cancer ward, giving it to everybody, and either uh, some patients refused it, or he didn't get to some patients in time, and those patients died. The patients who refused it died, or the patients he didn't get to died. The patients who died did not die of a thing called not taking medicine. They died of cancer. They, di- they died of a particular disease. Uh, when people are condemned who have never heard about Christianity, who have never heard about Jesus, they're, they're not condemned for not having heard about Jesus. They're condemned for the cancer. They're condemned for the sin. And well, what is, what is that cancer? That cancer is their own awareness of the standard they ought to be living by and their own refusal to live by it. Not only is, are they inexcusable on that basis, but they are inexcusable because they, if they're like any, everybody else in the world, the standard they do not apply to themselves, they do apply to their neighbor. I'm reminded of Ambrose Bierce's definition of a Christian, someone who believes the New Testament uh, is a divinely inspired book, admirably suited to the spiritual needs of his neighbor. Um, so that what do you have? Suppose, suppose God were to hang a invisible tape recorder around every person's neck. And this tape recorder was ingenious in that it only recorded moral judgments that the person speaking was applying to other people, moral judgments about others. He shouldn't have done that to me. I can't believe that she, this is really wicked what he did. So, so whenever, whenever a moral judgment is applied to somebody else, that invisible tape recorder recorded it. And let's say God had some a busy staff of angels editing everybody's uh, tape recording, everybody's tape recording, and from that tape recording, an individualized moral code was distilled, and then God judged every person by the moral code that they derived from his judgments or her judgments of other people. Well, we all know how this is going to go. It's going to be ugly, right? We're all going to fail when we are judged by the standard that we uh, judged others by. And, and, and this is kind of an open and shut uh, thing. And Paul describes uh, both sides of this uh, particular nutcracker as inexcusable. The, we, we defy what um, our moral sense tells us. We defy what the reality of God tells us we ought to do. And we... Um, apply that same standard that we've rejected for ourselves to others. God in the time of the sickness, God in the doctor too.